So we might begin, if that's fine with everyone, with the prayers. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Opening prayers. Praise to Shakyamuni Buddha, to the founder, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the foe destroyer, the completely perfected, fully awakened being, perfect in knowledge and in good conduct, Sugata, knower of the world, supreme guide of human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you, the completely and fully awakened one, the endowed transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subduer from the Shakya clan, I prostrate, make offerings, and go for refuge. Mm -hmm. Homage to the Supreme Buddha. Homage to the Dharma refuge. Homage to the great Sangha. To all three ever devout homage. To all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms in all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous actions. Perform only perfect virtuous actions. Subdue your mind thoroughly. This is the teaching of the Buddha. A star, a visual aberration, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, a drop of dew, or a bubble, a dream, a flash of lightning, a cloud, see conditioned things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the foe of faults, and be delivered from samsara's ocean, perturbed by the waves of aging, sickness, and death. Yeah. The Heart of the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra. I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time the Bhagawan was dwelling on Massa Vulture's mountain in Rajagriha, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagawan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, how should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara said this to the Venerable Sharadvati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this, correctly and repeatedly beholding those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch, and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, up to and including no aging and death, and no extinction of aging and death. 
Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared. Tayata, Om, Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasamgate, Bodhi, Soha. Shariputra, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva, should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagawan arose from that concentration and commended the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara saying, well said, well said, son of the lineage. It is like that. It is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagawan having thus spoken, the venerable Sharadvati Putra the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avaloki, Teshvara, and those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world of gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised that spoken by the Bhagawan. Short mandala offering. This ground, anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamniryatayami. Taking refuge and generating bodhicitta, once in Tibetan and twice in English. Sangye chodong so ki chognam la, jan chu bardu da ni kyab su chi, da gi chen yen gi pe sunam gi, dro la pen chir sangye dru parsho. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I am enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Supreme Assembly. By the merits I create through listening to the Dharma, may I become a Buddha in order to benefit all sentient beings. Thank you. So uh, the Ton Len verse, thank you. John, the uh, Guru Puja verse here. So while doing this um, practice, I just thought I came upon two examples just in the uh, popular press over the last couple of days. There was a, a, a young man of 17 who had saved up his pocket money for two years to buy his first car. And he, the other day, donated his car to uh, someone who had been a flood uh, victim recently. We had massive floods in New South Wales. So he, he located someone who'd not only lost their house um, and all their possessions, but also their, obviously their car, and he donated it to them uh, with the wish that he could, he could do more. How extraordinarily wonderful is that? And last night on the news, there was a man who had massive leg injuries in the Ukraine from uh, his house being bombed. And he just mentioned uh, that he had been injured uh, because he had thrown his body um, 
to protect his um, young son from, from injury. So th these are extraordinary examples of offering one's uh, body and, and one's sort of um, resources for the benefit of others. And if these things are happening in our ordinary world, we should, of course, rejoice and celebrate, but how much more wonderful if we could um, do this on behalf of all sentient beings. So one would have to say these people are already uh, trainee bodhisattvas. <laughs> so they're very inspiring cases. So um, establish the visualisation for the meditation with our guru on our crown or in front if we wish. Visualise all sentient beings throughout limitless space and feel that we're doing this meditation on their behalf. And thus, O oh Venerable Compassionate Gurus, we seek your blessings at all karmic debts, obstacles and sufferings. Of all mother sentient beings, may without exception, ripen upon us right now, and that when we give our happiness and virtues to others, and thereby invest all beings in bliss. And thus, O oh Venerable Compassionate Gurus, we seek your blessings at all karmic debts, obstacles and sufferings. Of all mother beings, may without exception ripen upon us right now, and that when we give our happiness and virtues to others, and thereby invest all beings in bliss. And thus, O oh Venerable Compassionate Gurus, we seek your blessings, that all karmic debts, obstacles and sufferings of all mother sentient beings may without exception ripen upon us right now, and that we may give our happiness and virtues to others and thereby invest all beings in bliss. So I feel that this has been accomplished. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how much material or how many topics I can cover today. I've actually prepared a kind of a very concise um, account of the remaining verses uh, so that I'm going to jump to those in order to complete the text as promised. So my earlier exposition with which I'm beginning now may or may not be sort of cut off at some point. So that's just the way things are. So um, I want to start with a very beautiful story that His Holiness tells. He says, what is this thing called me? Where would we say that this thing called me is located? It is a custom to break here for the day in order to leave time for practice, specifically for pondering and thinking in order to recognise the me to be refuted. Tie a rope around its neck and drag it here to show me tomorrow. Once, Milarepa asked a shepherd boy who was his disciple to make a similar investigation. The boy stayed up all night searching for this me. He came back the next day completely upset and worried, crying as if he had lost his sheep. He told Milarepa he could not find this me. He had thought that since Milarepa had been so sincere in asking him to find it, that it must be findable somewhere, end of quote. So I think um, the reason I wanted to um, quote this beautiful story is that there is a very special purpose in noting that it was a shepherd boy because he wasn't um, a great philosopher in one of the uh, sort of high seats of learning in ancient Tibet. So that when he heard the instruction and went away to look for his eye, he did it with complete, candid, open, ordinary earnestness, completely uncluttered by any preconceived philosophical prejudices or, or um, concepts. This is vital because it's indicating the kind of raw uh, contact we must have with this particular part of the instruction. So if we overlay it and we think we already know it, we'll go through it anyway because just to make sure we do know it, we're completely missing the point of its uh, poignant directness. So in verse, Will verse 102, Venerable Joan translation, 
Or so, at that time, may all the migratory beings of the high states fully meditate on selflessness, just like us. And then, free from conceptualization, recognize existence and peace as being equal. So last week, we began exploring how to approach a realization of selflessness of person or a person just like us. I'd now like to uh, delve just a little deeper into this meditation technique. It's first critical that we distinguish that in the text, there are two uh, distinct uses of the word self. And if we confuse them or compound them together, collapse them together, we're going to become very, very confused indeed. One meaning of self is a person or a living being. This is a, a person who loves, hates, walks, sleeps, and so on, who experiences the fruits of their actions and uh, goes through multiple rebirths and so on. We have no dispute with that use of self whatsoever. The other meaning of self occurs in selflessness, where it refers to a falsely imagined, over-concretized status of existence called inherent existence. This ignorance is an exaggeration, and it's the source of all ruination, as our text is made very clear. This is oft sometimes called the mother of all wrong attitudes, and perhaps we can even say it is devilish. And in this text, it has been referred to in devilish terms. In observing the eye that depends upon mental and physical attributes, this mind exaggerates it into being inherently existent, despite the fact that the mental and physical aggregates being observed do not contain any such exaggerated being. So a classic way of approaching this topic um, in a very, very uh, methodical and uh, rigorous way is to apply the four essential points, which have been very uh, clearly presented in Lama Tsongkhapa's middle length Lum Rim, which has been recently published. It was published earlier in a PDF form for FPMT students. And, but, I'm going to rely on, on the very uh, beautiful and profound presentation in The Practice of Emptiness, which um, John has apparently uh, found a better copy than this very treasured photocopy <laughs> that I've had for many, many years. And the reason it's so powerful is that it, it's experientially nuanced. So the fifth Dalai Lama says, if both the self that is the validly existent person and the self that is the non existent object of negation are not intimately identified. It is like dispatching an army without knowing where the enemy is, or like shooting an arrow without having sought out the target. So the word intimately identifying is critical here. That's why I told the story about the, the shepherd boy. So what this innate self-grasping at inherently existent I does is it reifies the status of the I. And this word reify comes up in some of the translations, increasingly so. And you might wonder what it means. It means making something substantial or concrete from an idea, turning an idea into an actual tangible thing. This process is reification and it's dynamic. It's describing a making substantial, a doing of substantiality actively. So that's worth bearing in mind. So it executes a stunning conjuring feat. It renders what it is hallucinating and projecting as real as the actual mode of existence of things upon which it is superimposed. So it's like a smothering blanket or a cover it completely obscures the reality of how ordinary things exist. So in the fifth Dalai Lama's concise account, he very uh, precisely identifies the object of negation of the person. He says, the person's mode of abiding as if able to establish itself from its own side without 
being mentally imputed. This is called a self or inherent existence. But the point is that this isn't just a definition to be learnt and uh, academically acquired and added to our shopping trolley of Buddhist wisdom. It has to be incorporated uh, into an investigation of our ordinary lived experience. Otherwise, we're going to run the fault or the danger that is um, fifth day alarm is identified of, of missing the target. So Kabje Zopa Rinpoche here um, refers to this first technique um, as one involving piling up like clouds. And I'll quote, in the teachings, the Tibetan term ling ngewa is used, which means piled up like clouds. This is like those times when you strongly attach to someone or when you feel very strong pride or powerful jealousy. Then, piled up like clouds, how do, does the I feel? Very real and very big. At those times, the I becomes very gross and seems to be independent. So the fifth Dalai Lama precisely elaborates what to do next. He says, in reliance on cultivating either of the two modes, and the two modes are thinking of a situation where we've either been abused or, or we've been praised or helped and we're delighted, extremely delighted, um, in dependence on those two modes, the manifest mind thinking I causes other coarse thoughts to become dormant. And you should allow the innate conceiver of the I to increase in strength. At this point, the way that the mind conceives the I should be analysed. And he continues, previously the thought of the eye seemed to exist in the centre of the heart, but how it existed was not ascertained. From now on, a corner of awareness is to analyse this well. Sometimes it will seem to be in the context of the body. Sometimes it will seem to be in the context of the mind. Sometimes it will be seen to be in the context of the other individual aggregates. So this is something we have to experience in our meditation. It will seem to be, sometimes it will seem to be in the context of the other individual aggregates. At the end of a rising of such a variety of modes of appearance, you'll come to identify an eye that exists in its own right, that exists inherently, that from the start is self-established, existing undifferentiatedly with mind and body, which are also mixed like milk and water. Now, this is absolutely critical to understand. And it also indicates how we must let the ordinary innate grasping appearance to sort of run its ordinary course without interfering, because otherwise we lose the opportunity of identifying how it appears to be shifting and moving around. So the, the fifth Dalai Lama concludes, you should analyse until deep experience of it arises. Having generated in your mental continuum, you thereby um, generate such in your mental continuum, you thereby crystallize an identification of the eye conceived by the inborn consciousness, conceiving the eye as self-instituting and having a relation with your own five aggregates like that of water into water. This is really, really important. If such an identification crystallizes, analysis alone will cause you to um, ascertain, attain an ascertainment of the absence of the inherent existence. If you do not identify such an I, analysis falls apart even without getting started. So often in discussion with students and you ask, how does the object of negation appear? They'll say it appears to be in my heart, appears to be in my body, it appears to be in my mind, et cetera, et cetera. All of this has been accounted for in his fifth Dalai Lama's account, but that mobility itself isn't an identification of this eye. We're not trying to find out where it's really housed, like the shepherd boy was doing, because it's able to sustain its appearance within a variety of secondary modes, if you like, and yet 
in all of them appear in and of itself self-instituting, mixed with the aggregates as though water into water. And so at that time of really identifying the object of negation, the aggregates do not appear as such. You see what this is getting at? If they are appearing, you haven't identified the object of negation. You haven't been precise enough. So it's necessary to go into meditational retreat, actually. And many of, of the uh, oral traditions argue that one has to also attain a single pointed concentration, samadhi, in order to be able to hold this subtle level of subtle object, um, if you like, uh, sufficiently to analyze. So Gendoga says, um, someone who is not trained to catch a snake is in danger of being bitten when they handle it. Likewise, if someone has not thoroughly understood this first point of analysis and proceeds to the next three points, there is no rule that says they can't proceed. But if they do proceed, there is a danger of falling into the extreme of nihilism. So this really indicates how, for many of us, we tend to think, oh, you've got that, identify the object negation, I'm now ready to do the rest of the meditation. So we really need to check, is, is that the case? So uh, the fifth Panchen Lama uh, speaks similarly. He says, when you analyze in this way, the first essential is to understand how the eye is conceived by the consciousness innately misconceiving and inherently existent eye. This eye is not other than my five aggregates or, or mind and body. This I is not any of the five aggregates or body and mind. This I is not any of the five aggregates taken either singularly, nor is it either of the two body and mind taken singularly. Also, this I is not just conceptually imputed to only the glittering collection of the five aggregates or a collection of the two body and mind. Hence, there is an I that from the beginning is self-sufficient. And he concludes, this way of identifying what is negated should be realized nakedly in your mental continuum without it being just an idea explained by others or a generic image evoked by words. It has to be experiential. So when we've reached this point of identification, Lama Yeshi in a Mahamudra course he gave at Tisha Centre in Bendigo um, gave the following very beautiful instruction. Practically, in order to do this meditation, we need to neutralise the mind, clean, clear. For this reason, we need to sit properly. To you people, I don't need to explain. Secondly, practice of nine-point breathing. This will enable some clarity of mind. So then we concentrate on this clarity experience and from there move to investigate the wrong view of the ego, how it is perceiving the eye. Then as the Panchen Lama advises, one has to be like a fish. This, the way the fish is moving within the ocean is similar. When we investigate the opposite of the Mahamudra wisdom, we need much contemplation free from distraction. Because if we don't understand the concept of ego and how it is projecting the hallucination, then our Mahamudra meditation becomes Mickey Mouse. So we're talking here of a part of the mind that is doing the investigation, moving like a fish in the ocean. And this is referring to it being incredibly subtle and discreet, like a spy. It's able to move with the discreet concealment of a spy with no one else noticing it's there. Because the moment we come in too hard or too heavy with our analytical mind, this naked appearance of the object of innate self-grasping as 
the uh, teachings will describe, will sink back into the aggregates and effectively disappear. And if we continue to meditate or think we've already realized emptiness, which some people do, by the way, because their eyes not appearing and they're doing analysis and maybe oh, they must have realized emptiness, this isn't the case at all. It simply means they've lost the clear holding of the identity of the innate self-grasping I. So the second point um, of the four essential points, which is determining the full set of possibilities, is sometimes described as um, ascertaining the pervasion. So it's very much about logic, and it's really describing the incredible role that logic is to play here. If, so it's hypothetical, if the thing being instinctively grasped at were, in fact, established by its own nature, it would necessarily be established as being either one or different from the basis of imputation, the aggregates. There is no third possibility. So it's, and this is where I'd like to spend a little bit of time. It's critical here that we don't just talk about ordinary sameness and difference here. This is because if the eye exists truly as it so palpably appears to do, and this is the fundamental question we're pursuing with what we call an ultimate analysis, then it must be either truly singular or truly plural other. If it's inherently existent, it can't be one and not the other. If it's inherently existent, it has to be findable there as one or the other, but it won't be. If we're looking for the eye in terms of conventional sameness and difference, we don't run into this logical problem because the eye and the aggregates are one. They're said to be one entity, but different conceptual isolates. They can be distinguished by a mind conceiving just the eye, or they can be conceived as the aggregates by a mind conceiving aggregates. We can make this distinction through the power of the mind. But in reality, we don't talk about them as being separate. And that's why when someone hits me, I go, I've been hit. We're not making any distinction here. But if I was, this I was inherently existent, then the question is going to arise, why do I respond when I'm hit if I'm not identical inherently to the body, for example. So you can see here already conundrums are uh, emerging. So His Holiness says on this step, now you need to establish the logical structure for the subsequent analysis. In general, anything that you take the mind, uh, take to mind has to be either one or it has to be more than one, singular or plural. For instance, it is obvious that a stone pillar and an iron pot are plural whereas a bowl is one thing, singular. Because this is the case, what is established inherently must also be either one entity or different entities. There is no other possibility. This means that if the I inherently exists, it must be either one with the body and mind, and it's completely one with the body and mind, because it's inherently the same, or it must be completely different from the body and the mind, which means it must be completely, completely different from the body and mind because it's inherently different, not just merely different. So you can see here how critical it is that we're looking at sameness and difference in this very nuanced manner. So if something is inherently the same, it has to be the same in every aspect. And if something is inherently different, it has to be other in every aspect. And the two can't communicate or fornicate or kind of cross-pollinate in any way whatsoever because they're inherently existent. So returning to the example of the eye, His Holiness says, now we're ready to analyze whether the eye can be one with mind and body and a whole uh, cascade of logical 
consequences now emerge. So I'm not going to, um, because of time, I'm not going to go into a full elaboration of these second and third points, because as I, I mentioned, they're, they're freely and very uh, clearly described here uh, in the texts. I just wanted to really indicate that if those first two steps haven't been adequately uh, engaged and uh, sort of experienced in, in meditational exploration, we're going to uh, miss the point. But I also want to mention that the fifth Dalai Lama and other Lamas mentioned that if we correctly ascertain the pervasion that has been established in the second step, already we'll have a doubt that this innate self-grasping eye exists in the way that it appears. Already we have a small glimpse of what it means for that eye to be non-existent, even though it appears as the real one. And so the second and third are extensions of that. So um, Jeffrey Hopkins, uh, and I don't know if you know this book, Tantric Techniques. Um, it's a uh, snow line publication. In the first chapter, he actually employs the fifth Dalai Lama's uh, text, which he also originally translated in this early 1972 um, Tibetan Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. Um, he gives his own sort of gloss of, of the root commentary. But I just wanted to, and it's a very fine uh, gloss, I just wanted to mention here that he, he talks about this need uh, to very clearly understand the second essential as uh, like a hammer, hammer and an anvil. He says, since this decision that inherent existence involves the necessity of the phenomena being either one or different from the basis of designation. It is the anvil upon which the sense of an inherently existent eye will be pounded by the hammer of subsequent reasoning. The second essential is not an airy decision to be taken lightly, despite its intellectual character, it must be brought to the level of feeling, this being done through considering that anything existent is either one or different. So the conclusion of, of the investigation when we can't find this inherently existent eye as either one with the aggregates or different to the aggregates is we're, we're left with this sheer unfindability. And it's said to be, Lama Zopram Shah describes it as, uh, for someone who hasn't experienced even the beginnings of emptiness before, as devastating. Because the real one, me, me, the real me, me, has suddenly not been able to be found at all. It's like losing the most precious thing that we know. And it's said, this is said to be the experience at death time when all the aggregates, everything else is crumbling away and falling away, all our senses are collapsing and so forth. And we're, we're getting to more and more subtle states of consciousness, no longer the outer world and all the domination of phenomena pouring in through the senses, all gone. And suddenly we're left with this sort of primordial arena in which we go, oh, I'm about to die. I appears undifferentiated here from any other phenomena. It's there, it's arising from where it appears to be, covering its own base totally real. This is what is going to be lost, this sense of I. And so for most people make a category mistake, if you like, of thinking this is death. This is the termination of me. You see how important this is? If we're a meditator who's practiced these techniques in, on our cushion, this is a unique moment, absolutely unique moment of realizing the emptiness of the eye and going into very advanced tantric meditations. So I just mentioned that as something that's very inspiring. Anyway, Kabjay Zopa says, by realizing the emptiness of this something not merely imputed, something extra, something that exists from its own side, 
we obtain the ultimate right view that is very close, extremely close to the point that I don't exist like that. It is not that you realise that the I doesn't exist, but it is kind of like that. Lama Zabrimsha is not talking about that moment of death here. It exists, but it's almost like coming to a point that it doesn't exist. Returning to the topic of the four schools, by meditating on this way, on the subtle dependent arising, as presented by the Prasangika school, we can see that there is no I or self on these aggregates at all, nor is the collection of the aggregates the I. It is completely empty. Yet before we do the analysis of how the I exists, we must recognise this I appearing to oneself appears as the real I, as if you could find it on these aggregates if you search for it. If we do search, however, it can't be found on any of these aggregates, from the tip of your hair down to the toes. Nowhere can it be found. Just as it can't be found anywhere on these aggregates, neither can be found anywhere separate or apart from them. So the eye that appears to us as if it is inside the body is completely wrong. This is the refuting object, just the appearance that there is an eye inside the body that there is an I there. There means on these aggregates. Such an I is a complete hallucination because if you look for it, it cannot be found. So when uh, Lambert refers to this I being uh, incredibly subtle, almost like it doesn't exist, he's referring not to the object of negation, but to the merely imputed I because it doesn't exist apart from conceptualization. So it's almost as though it doesn't exist. So I just mentioned that. So we, we, he segues into the, the second part of that, that passage to um, deal with the innate self-grasping. Now, one of the great problems here for us um, is that there's an apparent complication here because the mere eye, the one that is labelled in dependence on the aggregates also cannot be found upon investigation. So Kabje Zoparimpeche says, it is also the case that the eye that is merely labelled is also not findable as the same or different from its parts. But this merely labelled eye can be found in this room at this minute, because while the uh, because while the aggregates are here in this room, this merely labelled I can be found in this room. So when we say it is findable in the room, but not on the aggregates, we have to know the differences of meaning. In the same way, we must understand that the truly existent I cannot be found on this base. So I think uh, this is a very, very subtle point indeed. And, and Geshe Jumper Tech Chok um, illustrates how to understand it with a very clear example of the clock. He says, although the clock is unfindable on its basis of designation, all the parts that make it work, it is findable in general. When someone asks us, where is the clock? We point to it over there. While the clock exists on the table, it does not exist on its base of designation. Conventionally, a clock is on the table, but when we search in its basis of designation for what the clock ultimately is we cannot find anything. So this unfindability from this point of view is the subtle mode of existence of the clock. And understanding dependent arising is indispensable 
for understanding this. So the question is, how then does the I exist? His Holiness says, just as a car exists in dependence upon its parts, such as wheels, axles, and so forth, so a sentient being is conventionally set up in dependence upon body and mind. There is no person to be found either separate from the body and mind or within the body and mind. This is the reason why the I and all other phenomena are described in Buddhism as name only. The meaning of this is not that the I and all phenomena are just words, since the words of these phenomena do indeed refer to actual things. Rather, these phenomena do not exist in and of themselves. The term name only, this is critical because as I mentioned last week, a lot of scholars, particularly Western scholars, make this mistake. They, they sink uh, Majamika theory into a, a purely linguistic semiotic theory, which is a form of idealism, that nothing exists other than the meaning established by, by words, if you like. We need this reminder because the I and other phenomena do not merely appear to be merely set up by name and thought, quite the contrary. So if phenomena exist uh, the way they appear, which is truly as truly existent, then as we approach them with, an, as, with analysis, they'll become clearer and clearer. They'll become more evident to us. If something's true, it becomes clearer the more we investigate it. Therefore, when sought, it must be findable. But if on the contrary, it is false, when it is analysed and sought, it becomes less clear, and in the end, it cannot stand up to such analysis. And so there's a very famous verse here from Nagarjuna's uh, Garland. He says, a form that is viewed from afar is seen clearly by those nearby. If a mirage were actually water, why would those nearby not see it? Just as by those from afar, this world is seen as real. It is not so seen by those nearby for whom it is signless like a mirage. So it's crucial in further approaching this topic that we, we understand um, three levels of dependent arising and they are stacked, if you like, in, in terms of subtlety and grossness. So the most gross form is things and particularly um, impermanent things, uh, depending on, on causes. But in general, we can say that the, all things are dependent on causes and conditions, which includes permanent things as well. The second level of dependent arising is that things depend upon parts. And the third is the most subtle, and it's unique to Prasangika Majamika, which is that things depend on our conceptual imputation by thought. So it's really um, necessary here to understand uh, that we say a th dependent arising, things depend on something. L Lama's Open Bache says we must dispel the idea that this on is taken sort of prepositionally, if you like, to say that we're going to um, something's depend uh, labeled on something, like you might put a cup on a saucer. He says, no, that isn't the meaning of on here. On is referring to connoting to, relating to that, i.e. relating to the aggregates. That will help a lot as we approach this topic. So Kabjai's open Bache says, depending on the aggregates or even depending to the aggregates isn't uh, correct. Uh, what it means is that depending on the aggregates or even depending to the aggregates is the meaning here. Um, so because 10 drill, 10 means dependent and drill means connected. So it's connected to 
see here that we're getting away from this prepositional idea because we're looking for something sort of in physical time space again and, and it creates a lot of problems. So Jimpa uh, says that the conventionally existent I does exist, albeit conventionally. And I think it's worth reading this, his passage out here. He says, to the extent that some of our perceptions may actually apprehend objects of the world without grasping them as real or as possessing in intrinsic existence, we can say that a portion of even ordinary person's perceptions of themselves and the world can be considered valid. From this, we can surmise that Tsongkhapa does not reject all instances of I consciousness as delusory. There is a level of I consciousness that is related to our identity in a manner that does not impose any imagined mode of being. The object of such a consciousness is known as conventional self. So the extent to which I label this body and mind I and function is not to be refuted, it's valid. What we're refuting is the loading on top of this of an inherently existent I, which we grasp at as real. When we've dispelled this idea that the inherently existent I doesn't exist, we also dispel uh, that the idea that the inherently existent mind exists. And with this, we also collapse all of the property notions that we have. So if my house existed inherently from its own side, from its base of designation, then even if I sold it on the, on the market, it would still be my house because it is my house independently of being nominated my house by thought. So you can see here the kind of problems we quickly run into. So I just want to mention uh, quickly my uh, stem cells. When, when I went uh, to my uh, have my uh, bone marrow transplant, I received the stem cells of another person that were imported into my body to produce my blood. And when I was lying in hospital, you'd be delighted to know that I was doing these meditations as much as I could and thinking to myself, what is my blood? Where is my blood here? Because my blood is now being produced by a stranger through a surgical implantation in my body. So it can't be inherently my blood, but neither can it be inherently their blood, because if it was, it couldn't be working, transplanted into my body. And this is particularly the case because my blood type changed. There was no overlap with my old blood. My old, the, my, that entire thing was wiped away without a single molecule left behind. That was the purpose of the transplant, to get rid of the, the cancer, to down to the single cell that might be left behind as a remnant in my marrow. So fascinating, isn't it, to perform this uh, meditation on, our, on ourselves. So... I just mentioned here that uh, Lama Kabje Zobarusha mentions uh, a wonderful meditation here that if we've gone through the, the four essential points and we've sort of realized how the eye appears, we're in a position to simply sit there. And I'll describe the meditation. He says, there is a real eye in the sense of existing from its own side. It is the same as when you look at bright and blue colors in the brocade of tankas. Red is appearing on the red and blue is appearing on the blue from their own side. So now think of the self appearing from its own side and focus your mind right on that. At the same time, be aware that it is the object to be refuted. It is the object to be refuted and it is empty. In this method, you put more effort into understanding what emptiness means, 
the way it is appearing means it is empty. So I just mentioned that's a very uh, profound meditational technique. So we're now going to jump to uh, verse 102. Thanks, John, in the Joan translation. I'm going to have to bounce along here. Also at that time, may all the migratory beings of the high states fully meditate on selflessness, just like us, and then free from conceptualization, recognize existence and peace as being equal. So both existence and peace, referring to nirvana, are alike in being utterly devoid of existing by way of their own entity. This is made explicit in the Burzen translation, which reads, may they place concentration on both of these equally, seeing their natures as equally void, end of quote. Thus, sentient beings just like us are required to realise the non-self-existence of worldly involvement and freedom as well. So in this context, as Geshe Jumper Gutso explains, we're praying to Yamantaka that um, they, other sentient beings, may be able to fully meditate a completely pure wisdom realising selflessness, whereby free from conceptualization regarding the happiness of existence, psychic existence, and the happiness of one-sided nirvana, they generate a non-conceptual exalted wisdom, realizing that all phenomena are mere appearances and not established from their own side. Free from conceptualization, referring back to the Venerable Jones translation. Can also refer to the fact that in direct meditational equipoise on emptiness, there is no appearance of meditator, object of meditator, of meditation, and indeed any dualistic thing. Thus, we've gone beyond or reach beyond not only the limits of conceptuality when we're in this state, but the very limits of language that might describe such a state from within. So this leads us uh, to consider the topic of space-like meditative equipoise. As Hopkins says, although reasoning has led to this state, the mind is now not reasoning. It is experiencing the fruit of reasoning in a state of continuous one-pointed ascertainment of emptiness. The only thing appearing is the utter vacuity, the absence of inherent existence. So as the fourth Panchen Lama says, at that time, you should sustain single-mindedly the following two facets of understanding emptiness. From the point of view of ascertainment, firm definite knowledge determines that the eye does not inherently exist. Second, from the point of view of appearance, which is what's appearing to the meditator, there is an utter clear vacuity that is only the absence of what is negated. That is the true existence of I. Sustaining these two single-mindedly is how to, uh, to sustain the space-like meditative equipoise. And we must remember that in this space-like meditative equipoise, especially in the case of non-conceptual or direct realization of emptiness, any sense of duality has dissolved. So any independent appearance of a knower and a known has vanished. It's not saying that there isn't a knower and a known. They haven't been eliminated. It's simply that they cannot appear at that time. This is critical 
because many earlier scholars going right back into uh, Tibetan and Indian history uh, have argued that this unfindability while immersed in um, meditative equipoise directly on emptiness uh, is a proof that things don't conventionally exist at all. Their ultimate nature is their non-existence. This is very carefully and clearly refuted by Prasangika and particularly um, in Lama Tsongkhapa's presentations. In verse 103, Venerable Joan translation, if we do that, we'll destroy this enemy. If we do that, we'll destroy conceptualization. Having familiarized with the non-conceptual exalted wisdom of selflessness, why would we not attain the causes of the form body and their result? So I'll simply mention here that the enemy is self-cherishing, first line, and the bad conceptions or the conceptualizations in the second line um, are those um, products, if you like, of innate self-grasping ignorance. So self Grasp, um, self cherishing is only destroyed at its root by realizing emptiness because the function of self cherishing is predicated on the grasping at an inherent existent I and then grasping at things of use as inherent existent mine. You can see how this is looping back to incorporate all those former stanzas of the text. In 104, aha, all these are dependent relations. Dependent relations are dependent and non-self-sustaining. Changing back wood and forth, they are illusory false appearances. Like a whirling firebrand, they are reflections that appear. Illusory appearances. This is a reference to ordinary, conventionally existent things. These appear one way as inherently ex existent due to the embedded predispositions of ignorance in our minds from time immemorial, but they exist in another, which is that they're empty of inherent existence. Thus, within the purview of ordinary worldly cognition, appearances and reality are disjunct. Upon realizing emptiness, however, in the period subsequent to meditative equipoise, conventionally existent things do again, again appear to the meditator, but they are understood, and one might say here for the first time, they're understood to not exist in this concrete way in which they're appearing. Hence, they are able, again, for the first time, if you like, to comprehend them as illusory, false, appearances. The fifth Dalai Lama says, question, through having practiced a space like meditative equipoise, what occurs after equipoise? And the answer is a quote from the King of Meditative Stabilization Sutras, which says, like a mirage, a city of scent eaters, a magician's illusions and dreams, Meditation on signs is empty of inherent existence. No, all phenomena like that. After meditative equipoise, the appearance of a merely nom nominal eye remaining after the negation of the object of negation should be like a magician's illusion. And in praise of dependent origination, Tsongkhapa says, um, stanza 26, intrinsic nature, uncreated and non-contingent, dependent origination, contingent and created. How can these two converge upon a single basis without contradiction? Next verse, he says, therefore, whatever originates dependently, though primordially free of intrinsic existence, appears as if it does possess intrinsic existence. So you taught all this to be illusion-like. 
So we must be careful here that we don't uh, say that they're illusions and they don't exist because that would be nihilism. We say they are like illusions because they can be conventionally established as existent and function on that basis. So again, there's a very subtle, important point here. So in other words, we can, we can say that uh, what is left over after arising from meditative equipoise, space like equipoise, is things appearing with an illusion like nature. And so this is where the firebrand analogy comes in. All things are like a firebrand in that they are only imputed by name and conception, yet they appear to exist from their own side, just as does the circle of a whirling firebrand. But we know, don't we, there's no actual circle there. There's only one firebrand flying through space. The firebrand is always present where it's present. It's not present where it's not present. So there's no way of linking the individual moments of the appearance of the actual physical firebrand as it's swirling. Yet the optical illusion is of a continuous circle. This continuous circle is empty of being a real circle in that regard. So that's how the illusion works. So another, um, we're going to go to verse 105 here. This really extends this idea. Like a banana tree, our life force is essenceless. Like a bubble, our life force is without essence. Our life is without essence. Like a mist, things dissipate when touched. Like a mirage, they are beautiful from a distance. Like a reflection in a mirror, they appear to be really true. Like a cloud and fog, it seems that they will really stay. So from a Buddhist perspective, our life force is considered a non-associated compounded phenomena, which is neither consciousness nor form. Without it, consciousness cannot be sustained within the body. So if this life force existed from its own side, we could never age, we could never be born, we could never die. This is because our life force, like that sound that I described last week, could not change one iota. It couldn't strengthen, weaken, and of course, medicines would have absolutely no impact nor would they ever be required. So another very famous analogy is given of the plantain tree or the banana tree, which is in the first line of this verse. And it's uh, literally a water tree. If you peel away the outer layers of a banana trunk, you discover liquid mush that just disappears onto the ground. It's sort of call us in that regard. So if um, our, oh, anyway, that, that's the example of the selflessness. The plantain tree uh, collapses because it's a dependent arising, and so do we, because our life force is a dependent arising. And so it's got no more durability or sustainability intrinsically, than does that plantain tree rotting after a tornado or storm. So I might uh, jump here to the next verse. One oh six. The enemy, the self, and the executioner are just also like that. They seem to really exist, yet they have never been experienced to exist. They seem to be really true, yet they have never ex uh, been experienced to be true at all. They seem to really appear, yet have passed beyond being objects of superposition and deprecation. So beyond being objects of superimposition and deprecation refer to passing beyond, or rather, 
passing precisely between the two extremes of reification of true existence and nihilism, that things don't exist at all. This extreme becomes more of a possibility if a meditator seeking to realize emptiness misidentifies the measure of or fails to understand the significance of identifying the object of negation. And therefore, when they apply an ultimate analysis, they find nothing and therefore come to deprecate conventionalities in the sense of failing to value the varieties of appearances such as chairs and tables, you and me, cause and effect, etc. In other words, they refute too much. In the case of eternalism or the reification extreme, they don't refute enough because they leave uh, inherent existence intact and refute something else. This is particularly a problem incurred when one believes that one has realized emptiness completely, yet has not refuted, perhaps due to the uh, constraints of one's tenant system, the existence of things from the side of the base of designation. So in Prasangika Majamika, the belief that something exists in its base of designation is itself the measure of innate self-grasping. I just mentioned that. So um, we'll jump ahead here. Um, regarding the lines in that verse um, that they seem to exist and they seem to really appear, this is again a reference to the fact that when we are apply close analysis by a reasoning mind, uh, it will be shown that things do not exist concretely, yet when not analysed, they'll appear to have inherent existence. So this is why we, we get back to this idea of um, things as being illusory-like. And in verse 106, the reference to the self and the executioner or the butcher uh, we last saw this uh, as a refrain running from verses 52 to 90, and so the meaning is the same. In verse 107, given that what wheel of action exists here, even if they lack such inherent existence, just as the moon disk appears in water, actions and results are arrayed as a multitude of falsities. For mercy's sake, adopt and discard these mere appearances. So the first line refers to the manner in which the afflicted forward progression of the 12 links of origination may be severed by counteracting the first link, ignorance. Without the first link, the other links cannot be causally set up and thus work as links and thus the whole system of 12 falls apart, meaning that our actions performed within the supreme wisdom awareness of, um, or with the supreme wisdom awareness of non-duality do not function as the causes of the perpetuation of cyclic existence. Berzin translates these mere appearances here as, quote, acts that exist by themselves. So it's clear that when mere appearances in this context, as also in the neighbouring verses, um, uh, is not referring to merely imputed conventionality, such as karma, the moon, actions and agents and agency, which may be found to validly exist, but to grasping as real their appearances as inherently existence. So. Uh, this is why in the Burzen translation of this verse, we are asked not to burden these things that have never been real anytime, anywhere as things with ultimate value. In other words, we're being asked not to import inherent existence into those things that utterly lack it. In verse 108, 
just as when a peat fire blazes as an object in a dream, even though it does not exist inherently, we are frightened by its heat. Likewise, although the hell realm and so forth do not exist inherently, frightened of the mass of sufferings of being burnt and boiled, we should abandon them. So this is really a critical verse because it, a non-inherently fire, existent fire, still burns, albeit non-inherently. And it burns someone, albeit non-inherently. And this someone is also burnt non-inherently. Likewise, the frightening hell realms still function to frighten, though this fear does not exist inherently. All things function and can only function because they do not exist inherently. So Nagarjuna in, devotes a whole chapter to critiquing the self-existence of fire and fuel in Mula Majjhimika Karika. And Buddha Palata uh, glosses verse 1015, quote, just as fire does not come from another and it does not exist in fuel, so too the self also does not come from another and it does not exist in that appropriated. Just as the fuel itself is not fire, fire also does not exist apart from fuel. Fuel does not possess fire, fuel does not exist in fire, and fire does not exist in fuel. So too, that appropriated is not the self. The self also does not exist apart from the appropriated. The self does not possess that appropriated. That appropriated does not exist in the self and the self does not exist in that appropriated. So my gloss here is that if fire existed inherently, it would not rely on fuel. It would therefore burn eternally. Fuel would thereby become superfluous and there'll be no reason to call it fuel. But if, if fuel existed from its own side, it would be fuel even when it was not serving to burn a fire. Indeed, it could never burn, let alone to ashes, as it would always exist as fuel and thus could never be burnt. So in this uh, line, it says, um, likewise, although the hell realm and so forth do not exist inherently, um, there's a significance to this although, because it's saying that although they don't exist inherently, they can still bear their results. In fact, they can only bear their results because they don't exist inherently. So the commentary um, for this verse reads, moreover, the fires, the incandescent iron foundation, the weapons and so forth of hell, in reality, also do not have even a mere atom that is inherently established. Nevertheless, they can be stopped from the perspective of a person who has accumulated bad actions and the sufferings of being burnt, boiled, and so forth. This is because we can abandon their causes because they don't exist inherently. So as Gen Doga says, because cause and effect exist conventionally, we have to create virtue and watch our karma and be aware, aware of the law of cause and effect. So we'll jump now to verse 109. Just as when, even though there is absolutely no darkness, delirious with fever, it is as though we are roaming about and suffocating in a deep cave, Likewise, although ignorance and the collection do not exist inherently, we should eliminate this error by means of the three wisdoms. So the 
analogy of delirium works here to describe a person who grasped at non-inherently existent things as real. Someone who knows they don't exist in that way can approach the products of delirium as exactly that, hallucinations pertaining just to the mind of that delirious person. Likewise, those driven mad by ignorance are in a perpetual state of delirium because they are immersed and trapped in a cage or cave of their own projected feverish fabrications. Like a fog in a well, they believe that this is the world. In a well, they believe this is the world. In other words, they can see and believe in nothing other than these appearances to their mind. So Geshe Doga summarizes, because one believes in this true existence, one experiences various kinds of sufferings. Even those, those various kinds of sufferings one experiences lack inherent existence, they are still existing conventionally. And so they can't be uh, completely negated. So the three wisdoms referred to in this verse at the end there are refer to the wisdoms of hearing, contemplation and meditation. Or they can also be cast as the wisdom realizing emptiness by listening, the wisdom realized by inferential cognition and the wisdom realized by direct cognition. Verse 110, uh, when a magician plays a song on a lute, the sounds if analyzed do not exist, in fact exist inherently but when not analysed, the arisal of pleasant sounds by means of the collection dispels the anguish in the minds of beings. I think I, I really um, dealt with that one last week. Verse 111. Similarly, when actions as well as causes and results are analysed in their entirety, although they are not inherently one and not inherently different, phenomena are produced and disintegrate as though really appearing and the various happinesses and sufferings or experiences though really existing, for mercy's sake, adopt and discard these mere appearances. So we can extend the logic we just saw in verse 110 regarding the beautiful sounds emitting from the lute. This sound does not exist inherently because it rises in dependence on causes and conditions. Sound is neither a truly existent one or a truly existent many because it is established in dependence on parts. This means it can't be found in its parts or in its collect their collection in their shape or apart from them. Similarly, one still experiences happiness and suffering, etc., depending on their causes. Similarly, one can say that actions do exist and function depending on their causal relations, their parts and the imputing mind. If the action of moving the arm, for example, existed inherently, the arm would always be moving, even when at rest. An action is merely imputed in dependence on an actor and uh, something acted upon. Thus, all three spheres are empty. So we'll jump now to Will verse 112. When drops mm -hmm. of water fill a vase, the vase is not filled by the mm -hmm. first drop, nor is it filled by the individual drops, the last and so on. Rather, the vase is filled by the collection of dependent relations. So the fact is, we can't pinpoint a single drop that is responsible for the filling of the vase. If there could, could be, there'd be as many vases filled as there were drops. If every drop was an inherently existent vase filler, then each drop would fill the vase. But even conventionally, neither is the vase filled by the first drop or the middle drop or the last drop. This is because each drop can only contribute 
apart towards the completed act of filling, which is reaching the brim. But even this filling and this completed act of filling do not exist from their own side. Otherwise, the vase would be filled independently of drops, and the vase would always be found full, as because that is its final nature. Therefore, what fills the vase are a collection of drops that, because they are dependent relations, utterly lack existence from their own side, as does the act of filling and as does the full vase. Indeed, a drop can only be called a vase filler uh, when it's comprehended as such upon designation by someone who is also designating vase. If that same drop fell on a rock, would it still be a vase filler? What uh, would it appear as even a drop's worth of vase filling in those circumstances? And how could it function as a rock wetter if it was inherently only a vase filler due to its singular independent nature? So Geshe Doga swings this sort of uh, verse back to a crucial issue that we respect even a small act of virtue, which is likened to a drop, and bemoan performing even a small act of non-virtue, because yes, because they are not inherently existent, they can accumulate and bear larger consequences. So we'll jump now to uh, verse 113. Similarly, whenever anyone experiences the results of happiness and suffering, it is not due to the first instance of the cause, nor is it due to the last instance and so forth. Rather, due to the collection of dependent relations, happiness and suffering are experienced. For mercy's sake, adopt and discard these mere appearances. So we can apply the same logic again. If causes existed inherently, they couldn't be assembled, nor could they ripen, or more particularly, ripen as an accumulation to bring about a common and, this, and in this sense, unified result. If, on the other hand, we accept that the first instance of the cause is, in, cause is inherently existent, then we're, we face the obvious question, how can it then cause, in the sense of accomplish, the entire result? If we argue that it needn't, it only needs to contribute upon ripening the first portion of an entire result, then we face a very serious logical dilemma. How then can an inherently existent first portion come together with a second and third portion to accumulate the complete result of happiness or suffering? As each portion is inherently complete within itself and refers only to itself, there'll be no way it could communicate with or uh, hook up with, if you like, the other portions. So the logic here can be extended or swung back to the very notion of first and last instance. From a Prasangika perspective, these are only ever merely imputed to something that is not inherently a first or last moment. The interdependent relation uh, reality is that we only call the first instant, the first instant, independence on the second and the third. Indeed, a continuum is itself only ever merely imputed upon its parts, and its parts are only ever imputed in dependence on their aggregation. This is similar to the point made earlier about the relationship of the characterized and, and characteristics. One cannot exist without mutual dependence on the other. So Songkarp in his commentary on Nagarjuna's chapter called Examination of Time, because uh, inherently existing time is also dismantled by the Prasangika dialectic, quote, it is not at all possible for the three temporal modes to exist through their own characteristics, neither than which has arisen earlier and ceased, nor that which has 
not yet arisen, nor that which has arisen earlier and not yet ceased. Nonetheless, one should confirm one's ascertainment of the two truths through thinking that it is absolutely tenable that they are essenceless, that is empty of their own characteristics. So we'll jump now to verse 114. Oh, this appearance which is joyous when left alone without investigation is indeed without essence. Nonetheless, this phenomena that appears as though it exists is profound and difficult for the inferior to see. So I, just, I think I described that um, idea of being, when left alone without investigation, to be uh, the measure of the valid appearance of conventionally existent things. If we then enter that with an ultimate cognizer blazing and attempt to find the real conventionally existent tree where there appears, uh, where a tree appears, we're not going to find it. So we haven't. Uh, left, the, left it alone and will be in danger of uh, not being able to uh, support the validity of that tree's existence. So I'll have to jump here because of time. Verse 115, now when absorbed in equipoise by means of meditative stabilisation, how can even mere appearances definitely exist? For, furthermore, how can the existent and the non-existent also exist? How can anyone anywhere assert there is and there is not? So this verse is describing uh, the status of a complete, a direct non-conceptual meditative equipoise on emptiness. To a wisdom re directly realizing shunyata or emptiness, only emptiness appears. The basis of that emptiness, conventional thing, does not appear nor does any other conventionally existent thing. Even emptiness itself lacks inherent existence. One might wonder how can this be? His Holiness explains that when we approach ultimate reality as the focus of our ultimate analysis, the emptiness in this context is a conventional phenomena, one that is also found to be empty. So in his Holmes's words, when that ultimate truth becomes the basis of analysis and when its mode, being, uh, mode of being is posited, then that ultimate truth becomes the basis of qualification in relation to the quality of lacking inherent existence that is its mode of being. Thus, there is even an explanation that in these circumstances on emptiness, um, in these circumstances, emptiness can be viewed as a conventional truth. I mentioned this in passing um, because it uh, points us towards a very important point. But as Ch Chandra Kirti says, all phenomena have two truths. It must be possible to posit these truths in respect of each and every phenomena. So this includes emptinesses and those things that aren't emptinesses. And in this regard, we can refer to the table as the substratum and the emptiness as its feature or attribute. And the emptiness, it's the basis of investigation to see what its final mode of existence is. Is it a truly existent emptiness? Is the substrat and its attribute is the discovery that is, it is also empty. And in this way, we have the emptiness of emptiness of emptiness and emptiness in an infinite regression. Will verse 116. Objects and the reality of objects do not exist. And if we abide quietly without contrived intelligence in the primordial state that is free from all adopting and discarding and free from elaboration, we will become great beings. So uh, this is a reference to the lack of inherently existent conventionalities, but it's also, again, a reference to the lack of inherent existence of ultimate reality, emptiness itself. And Tsongkhapa says in Praise of Dependent Origination, by grasping at it the childish strength and bondage to extreme views, for the wise, this very fact is the doorway to cut free from the net of elaborations. So the crucial point here is that we grasp at world of concerns as truly existent. And based on that, 
are conceiving um, by grasping that way we generate the four distorted conceptions holding things to be impure and so forth or pure and so forth and we grasp at these sorts of appearances various appearances as also real and the root from which these inappropriate thoughts arise this whole cascade of inappropriate thoughts is the elaboration holding that things are truly existence so worldly elaboration we we'll focus on this word elaboration, without exception is stopped by emptiness. These are the words of Chandrakirti. That is, by seeing the emptiness of all things, how? If things are seen as real, there will be the elaboration described earlier. But if, for example, not seeing the daughter of a barren woman as real, a lustful person will not give rise to elaboration with her as an object. If elaboration does not occur, then inappropriate thoughts do not occur, then the group of mental afflictions rooted in the view of perishable collection, having grasped up iron mine, will not arise. If the mental afflictions rooted in the view of the perishable view do not arise, then karma will not be created. If karma is not created, there'll be no experience of samsara known as birth, aging, and death. So this passage very clearly explains that by perceiving the absence of inherent existence and only by perceiving emptiness do we become free of the elaboration of true existence that give rise to appropriate thoughts holding the object to be blissful pure permanent and a self and this is the uh, of course the exact opposite way to which things are existing so um I'm going to jump now to verse 117, which is our dedication verse. In this way, by practicing the conventional mind of enlightenment and the ultimate mind of enlightenment, we may we accumulate, accum, accumulate, accumulate, strange, isn't it? The two collections without interference and then bring the two welfares, our own and others, to perfection. So this marvellously sums up the essence of our entire precious text and reveals the full significance of the need to develop both conventional and ultimate bodhicitta in tandem. To do this on behalf of others should be our primary aim from now on. Only in this conjoined manner of practising wisdom and bliss or merit and wisdom together do we fully develop the two collections and thus acquire the two kayas of a fully enlightened being. How wonderful if our time spent together studying this extraordinary text uh, could accomplish this as explained. So um, I'm going to quote uh, Geshe Doga's words here in the form of, of uh, preparing the dedication, which I realised Venerable Dondrup's here as well, so I'll be able to hand over. Having generated conventional bodhicitta with the help of various signs, reasons, and analysis, the bodhisattva extensively investigates the ultimate truth of phenomena, trying to understand ultimate truth or emptiness. In this way, he or she meditates on and develops ultimate bodhicitta. Having generated conventional and ultimate bodhicitta, the bodhisattva then meditates on the union of conventional and ultimate bodhicitta attempting to complete the two collections of wisdom or insight and merit. When these two collections of insight and merit have been completed, the bodhisattva attains complete Buddhahood or full enlightenment and then is able to completely fulfill the wishes of other sentient beings. So this marvellously sums up uh, our entire, the essence of our entire precious text and reveals the full significance of the need to develop uh, conventional and ultimate bodhicitta in tandem. So this should be our primary aim from now on. So uh, I'm just going to do reasons of auspiciousness recite uh, the first few lines of the text again. The Mahayana mind training, wheel of sharp weapons. It is called the wheel of sharp weapons. It strikes the enemy's vital point. To the great wrathful one Yamantaka, I pay homage, just as when peacocks wander in jungles, 
of lethal poison. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Ross, for such a precious teaching and in the way that you've embodied the teaching as well, just by your very demeanor, nature, and your acts. So thank you. Um, we, we are honored to have uh, Venerable Dondrup here as well. Um, would you care to say something? Uh, <laughs> sorry to, if I'm putting you on the spot, I can always uh, take, take over if you like. Uh, no, of course. So just on behalf of the center, I too wanted to, to thank Dr. Moore for uh, months of wonderful teachings and he's generously agreed um, to, to teach two more classes for us uh, later in the year, June and August. And, and we hope, um, you know, that this continues um, maybe even later in the year and next year and uh, far into the, the future, this wonderful collaboration. We're so um, grateful that he's joined our center and is able to give such wonderful teachings. So I don't wanna deprive Stephen of the merit of, of offering, but, uh, but uh, just really grateful to have you join our, our faculty of teachers. Thank you. Well, um, I thought I might um, just ask if anyone else wanted to give words of appreciation or thankfulness and just let Ross know how, as you've communicated to me, how he's touched your heart. Would anyone like to say anything? Uh, please go ahead, yes, Nancy. I do. Let's Thank start with... you so much. Okay, let's go with Danny then. My, my microphone is not that good, but I think you can hear. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm delighted that people uh, sort of stayed with us during the text. It, it's, a, it's a very extensive text, and I, I think a very demanding text, and it does strike the point, doesn't it? So the, the point strikes the enemy's vital point. So um, we've sort of been doing that together, I think. So thank you. And Dr. Bross, thank you so much. I so appreciated also your very personal stories as throughout the class and um, praying for your healing and continued health. I just hope all goes well for you. You are a gem. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can only just echo that too, Ross. It was really um, earth moving for myself. Um, made me really think about things that I hadn't thought about before. So it really has been one of the, a, a thing that I'll treasure. And I've, I've got a lot to, uh, to cognize now. It's certainly not just a matter of ticking off this course. It was wonderful, Ross. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for your role as well with the technical side of things. They all went <laughs> flawlessly. <laughs> there were the few so problems. Wouldn't happen without you guys. And to thank you. Thanks, Stephen, as well, of course, before you might cut me off, because um he's been superb to work with. And uh every, you know, we've communicated very comfortably and openly, and I trust him as a friend to to bring up any issues and so forth. And the venerable Don Drop as well has made it as, as sort of seamless and as sort of approachable as possible. And my decision to sort of um, maybe do a little bit more teaching is, is based on that very, very happy experience. Uh, thank him as well. And the centre too. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the centre's not remote from me here. I remember one of my friends got into trouble. She's doing Aboriginal studies at um, Australian National University and she referred to some Aboriginal communities as remote in a class presentation. And the Aboriginal students present jumped on her vehemently and said, remote to whom? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you. I'll hand back there. Are we doing the prayers? I think Doris uh, has uh, a few oh, words. Oh, sorry, sorry. Thank you very much, Ross. I thought of a better adjective for uh, this, this whole teaching has been elegant just so nicely put together and it's it's one I'm going to treasure for sure. Um, 
Thank you very much. And I'm very glad to hear that you're coming back. It's going to I mean, be. I've seen the, the other two classes, you'd be delighted to hear it as more like, I thought to myself, fireside chats. Nice. Because um, I've been very much um, not constrained, that'd be the wrong word, but uh, almost dominated by the enormity of this text. And, and trying to squeeze it into our format has, has proved very, very even excruciating at times. And um, particularly these last verses where we really need to be able to unfold them and spend some time, I've had to sort of just gloss over. So um, nonetheless, it, it is an extraordinary text and my time with it as well, preparing has, has brought me uh, closer to realizing just how extraordinary it is to even have this opportunity. And Kabjo Zopa Rinpoche often says, you know, to even hear the word emptiness, is the most remarkable thing. So to be able to bring the importance of realising emptiness together with the need to overcome self-cherishing completely in order to fulfil our bodhisattva goal, that is the very essence of our, our path. So it's been very, very, very pertinent. So I just mentioned after um, the prayers that led, led, I just wanted to recite um, several verses from Lama Tsongkhapa as dedication as well. And um, we'll do the long life prayers. And then I thought at the end uh, we could recite uh, Migmi say praise to Lama Tsongkhapa as uh, reasons for auspiciousness. Thank you. So back, back to John. Yeah. Stephen, I mean. Uh, sure. How about, how about this? We'll do a quick Thanksgiving mandala just to kind of summarize and encapsulate our true gratitude to you, Dr. Ross. And then we'll go into the prayers, and if John would show them then, and then the may say, or, you know, um, go ahead if you would, Ross, and um, plus your verses from Amazon Kappa. So um, let me just put that up. Thank you. Thanksgiving mandala for Dr. Ross. Thank you so much. This ground anointed with perfume, strewn with flowers, adorned with Mount Meru, four continents, the sun and the moon. I imagine this as a Buddha field and offer it. May all living beings enjoy this pure land. May my venerable Lama's life be firm, his divine white actions spread in the 10 directions May the torch of the teachings of Losan always remain, dispelling the darkness of all beings in the three realms. Idam Guru Ratna Mandala Kamiryataya. And John, if you would. Sure. Thank you, sir. Dedication prayers. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a Guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish but increase more and more. And just before the long life prayers, I'll recite the dedication prayers uh, from Tsongkhapa's In Praise of Dependent Origination. May the teaching of this beneficent one till world's end be unshaken by the winds of evil thoughts. May it always be filled with those who find conviction in the teacher by understanding the teaching's true nature. May I never falter even for an instant to uphold the excellent way of the sage, which illuminates the principle of dependent origination through all my lives, even giving away my body and life. May I spend day and night carefully reflecting by what means can I enhance this teaching achieved by the Supreme Savior through strenuous efforts over countless eons. As I strive in this with pure intention, May Brahma, Indra, and the world's guardians and protectors such as Ma Kala unswervingly always assist me. Thank you. 
Long life prayers for His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, the wish-granting, wish-fulfilling jewel, source of every single benefit and happiness in this world, mm -hmm. to the incomparably kind Tenzin Gyatso, I beseech, may all your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. To Lama Zopa Rinpoche, you who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serve as the bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjuna's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplish magnificent prayers, honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And Tenzin Osel Hita, venerable one to you whose kindness exceeds that of all the conquerors, for those wanderers in far off places, especially the West, mindful of your loving concern for us in intentionally descending again into a family of a far distant land, we make this request. O Lama, please, please live long. And uh, the long life prayer for the Venerable Geshe Doga. You with an immutable vow to spread to the limits of space, the Dharma of the Able One in general, and the Dharma of the Pure Minded Conqueror, Tsongkhapa. Supreme, superior, spiritual friend of unrepayable kindness, please remain for hundreds of eons and bestow the supreme and common cities. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. Is it there in our prayer book there? I'm not sure. <laughs>